Hello and welcome to the Overly Animated Podcast, where we take animation seriously. I'm Dylan Heisen with Michelle Ander. Hello. And we're uh, very excited today to be joined by special guests, uh, Rad Seacrest and Bill Wolkoff, uh, executive producers of Keep on the Age of Wonder Beasts. Uh, hi guys, thanks for joining us. Great yeah. to meet you guys. Hey guys. Hey, um... Yeah, we uh, we uh, talk, we t- we had a podcast before on Kipo season one, and we loved it. Um, you can find that at overlyanimated.com. And today we're going to be talking with Rad and Bill about the season and the show in general. Um, so I think without further ado, I guess like uh, we can get started by uh, by by saying like it's been a few weeks, I think, since since Kipo came out. Um, I, th- I think you two in particular have been really involved in in the community and everything. So like, what's what's it been like um, having people finally seen Kipo and seeing all the fan response to the show? It's it's pretty crazy. I mean, I'm constantly just checking Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's right. So we're going on Discord and Reddit. It's been pretty fun uh, to see all the response. It has been the the best rabbit hole to fall into uh, oh, that man. we could fall into. <laughs> um, right. it, it's uh, it's like so exciting to see that the show has ha- seems to have connected in ways that we had hoped it would connect, and and uh, there's always more people <laughs> responding. So uh, um, I'm going to try to resist uh, checking Twitter while we do this interview. <laughs> <laughs> I'm loving all the fan art, and I also love going in and reading fan theories, like on Tumblr and Reddit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you guys are uh, just being like, wait till you wait till you see what's coming on uh, on a lot of this. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and wait, so, somebody somebody this morning, I, I think it just needs to be pointed out, actually made a wolf pelt that I'm hard pressed to believe was not taken from an actual wolf and put on a child. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was, it was amazing. Photo- yeah. It was a photograph on Reddit with an actual death stalker staff too, uh, that I would believe is functional. Yeah. <laughs> That's commitment. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And, and seeing like seeing the show grow in popularity. I also saw it on like my, my popular feed on Netflix. Um, I know a lot of people have been seeing that. Um, really exciting. Um, yeah, that was exciting to see too. Uh, Michelle, um, I guess I was a little curious. Just, I'm sure you both feel pretty good about the show you've made, and there, there's been a lot of really positive articles and responses to it. Has the reception been about what you expected, or is it more? How how are you feeling about that in general? I, I think for me as a creator, I I was talking to this uh, about this with one of my friends. You kind of only see the flaws. Oh. So like as a creator, you're like, oh, I wish this could have been better. Oh, I wish you could have done that. Oh, I wish this was that like that. So you're just in this place of so when people respond positively to it, you're kind of like, oh, OK, cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's awesome. Yeah. Um uh, do you guys want to talk about um, for for people who aren't aware what uh, each of you did uh, primarily on the show? Yeah, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about. I was um, I was doing Kipo as sort of like a web comic, mm-hmm. and it got picked up by DreamWorks, and they they had me sit down with Bill, and Bill had a lot of experience in TV, so he really fleshed it out into a kind of a bigger idea. And Bill, do you want to talk? A little bit about that? Uh, yeah, we were um, basically set up on a work blind date. Um, and <laughs> I had been sent Rad's webcomic. Um, and I so, so loved his uh, drawing style um, mm-hmm. and the, uh, the initial world. I completely fell in love with it. Um, and it's that thing, and it's like a date. So you go in the meeting, and you you know you talk about like, oh, this is how I do it as a TV show, and pretend like, yeah, it's you know no big deal, but like, please let me do it this way. Let's let's do it this way. Um, and happily, you know that uh, wound up being a good good partnership. Rad uh, uh, responded to my thoughts about how to build it out, and we developed it for a year. Um, and uh, I'm a writer, uh, so my you know big 
uh, you know, job on the show was, was writing the script and overseeing the script. Um, and, and, uh, but we, you know, on the, in the early stages, we were, uh, both, uh, doing, uh, I mean, Rad is a director. I cannot draw. <laughs> um, but, uh, we were, it was this dream collaboration where I had written this, the first script Rad had, um, then was boarding the first script while, I was plotting out what the, the, you know, season would be. And this was before we had our full crew on, um, like on, on a, on a huge dry erase board. Um, and that was all (laughs) in the early, early stages as we were, um, you know, creating the animatic for the first episode. And it was after that, that we were able to bring on our full crew, uh, um, but in those early days, it was just the two of us (laughs) in, in an office together, uh, um getting that was started probably the uh, most fun because yeah we were sharing an office and like i'd get the script and sit down and i'm used to in feature we do a lot of comedy writing so i was just like oh what if like when she gets out she sees the sun and falls back that'd be funny or like oh <laughs> like when wolf and them hook up wouldn't it be funny if there was like a plant full of dead things and she's like lifting you know like adding a lot of little gags here and there and and it was just fun to kind of brainstorm and bounce the real like collaborative effort at the beginning oh, that's so I, cool I, to hear I, I liken the the storyboarding process to when you start filming a live action show and sometimes the you know things just come alive in a way that you never expected when you start rolling a camera so like when uh, so there's, there's a lot of evolution that happens from script to storyboarding um and for the two of us to be literally in the same space uh, um, where, you know, Rad would pitch these amazing jokes or visual ideas and be like, yes. And then sometimes, you know, uh, scenes evolve in ways that they just never would have. If it was just, you know, when it's just you alone in a room writing a script, it's, it's yeah. truly the most glorious thing. Um, and we tried to infuse that spirit. We set up a process to infuse that spirit throughout the entire production um of uh, of the show yeah that, that's awesome um i i know a little bit ago you guys mentioned kipo starting as uh rad's webcomic and i think a lot of people are c- uh, curious about um details from that i know i saw uh part or all of it on on reddit uh, it was really cool to see that link there but um was uh, what what's like what kind of went to went uh went behind dreamworks seeing that and picking that up so quickly yeah so i think i was 30 pages in either 30 or 33 i can't really remember but um so i was at the time i was working on how to train your dragon 2 and i kind of had drawn some drawings of it and i was working it out and then i was on boss baby and i i was just like you know what i'm gonna quit and do this web comic and they were like well do you want to work two days a week <laughs> and I was like, okay <laughs> so i would come in and work on boss baby and the other three days i just wake up early in the morning and just be working on this comic all day and um i think peter gal saw it who who runs dreamworks now he's like we should find out who's doing this and it they found me (laughs) and i was already at dreamworks Um, and i sat down and had coffee with them and he was like it was funny because he's like you know if you would have came up to me and said hey i have a post-apocalypse cartoon pitch i would have told you nah i don't even want to hear that but seeing the way you did it and made it fun, like, wow, that's pretty cool. Like, would you would you want to do this as a TV show? And I was like, uh, yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, and I kind of just switched gears. I, I shut down the comic and just went full steam mm. um, trying to work on how this was going to be a TV show. And the, the comic did skew a little darker. Like, I had things in mind. Like, in my mind, I was going to cut off Jabok's tongue. Like it was a little more oh, Game wow. of Thronesy. Um, <laughs> the the villain in my mind, he, it's funny. Me and Bill, Bill came up with the style independently, but I actually showed him. I'm like, dude, I have these old drawings. My old villain was a human in Louis the Fourteenth outfits. I but he was like a cannibal. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, they, that's interesting. So, the, like the the aesthetic of Scarlamine was kind of there uh, conceptually. You were thinking, but, that when you were but the comic. Bill Bill literally came to me. He's like, "I have this idea," and he pitched me that he didn't know I had drawn that. Awesome. 
I was like, that's so weird. I have this drawing of the Louis the Fourteenth like character. It was it, it was a sign of the the whatever warped part of Rad's brain was connecting with a warped part of my brain. Uh, <laughs> the the same way. <laughs> or like um, me and Bill went to Korea and we both looked at each other. We had the same suitcase. And it's like a really weird suitcase. <laughs> oh my God, that's right. We do have the same suitcase. And, and I, I think we both left with our suitcases. I honestly don't know. We, yeah. we might have been, we might have been wearing wearing each other's clothes for the last uh, you know uh, a year, but uh, um, but that is true. We actually do have the same houndstooth su- uh, uh, suitcase. <laughs> that's great. Uh... Cool. Well, get, I want to get into a little some of the aspects of, of the show. Um, I think a big one that stands out to a lot of people, seen a lot of people talking about, is the use of music um, and the, like, yes. the style of it and how unique that is. Um, so I guess, like, what kind of inspired the style, like, the feel of the the music for the show and and all the ways that it was implemented? You know, it's, it's interesting because sometimes the, a lot of that is subconscious and you're not necessarily, like, planning that. It's like you put in the things you like, you know? and um, I, when I looked back at it, I suddenly realized, cause I grew up skateboarding and I watched so many skateboard videos and, and everything is timed to the beat to a lot of hip hop and indie rock. And I realized like, Oh, I was kind of subconsciously making like a skate video. Mm. <laughs> mm. Brad and I, Brad and I are also both from the east part of east side of Los Angeles. Rad, Rad lives in Highland Park. I, I live in Atwater Village. Uh, our musical tastes, and, and also, by the way, if you look at some of the uh, um, Las Vistas in our show, is our version of Los Angeles, um, and many of the locations were inspired by east, sections of the east part of Los Angeles. But I, I bring it up that the, there is kind of a very uh, also intersection of musical tastes uh in this you know on the east side of los angeles um and it was important for us to make music um a part of this world because uh it's our world 200 years in the future um and uh because the animals that have mutated and grown have adopted human culture uh it made sense to us that they would push forward music as well um and uh we just we just looked for as many opportunities as we can to organically bring music into the world with benson um uh i think the uh, that the benson's introduction um i live very close to a bunch of transmission towers um like the ones that he climbs um and i'd come up with that and then rad put on top of that this this amazing uh story element that that benson uh you know likes to hunt for you know whenever he's scavenging he'll also find um old cassette tapes whenever he can and that was a great way to um use needle drop as actual score uh in our show in a way that was organic to his character um and then in terms of the mute communities that that have uh you know been uh, around for th- these 200 years each community has their own brand of music that is that is borrowed from the society the rubbles of the society that they that they found and built their world on um and uh we just thought that it was a real opportunity to uh bring um the ta- the, the sound tapestry of the world that we both know to this world um, and make it uh, uh, feel even more alive than it would with just a traditional score. That's awesome. Yeah. That's a really cool answer. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, now that you explain it, it makes total sense that a lot of this really vibrant music is tied to these locations where all these different, say, mutes have their factions. And that would inform a lot of the music because at the time it's just like, oh, this is a really good song. Oh, this is a really good song, too. Like, everything's just... But, like, that kind of surface level thing is kind of all I initially was able to take away from it. But, I mean, yeah, it would make sense that, like the communities, the evolution of that would influence the mutes and everything that they have going on with all their aesthetics. So Mm -hmm. it's just, it's cool to know. 
There's also a trick I learned from Chris Sanders when I was working on Crudes, I think, or maybe it was something else, but he would do a thing where when he was pitching his storyboards, he'd hit play on a song. And um, he was talking about, if you remember in the first How to Train Your Dragon, that scene with the dragons, with uh, Hiccup and Dragon, and the dragon where it's like, there's no dialogue the whole scene, and it's all music. Mm-hmm. And he was talking about, like, he was bummed out on some movies he worked out. When the score was just getting good, someone would say a line, and then you'd have to dip the score out and bring it oh. back in. So he he specifically thought, I want to do a whole scene without any dialogue. And that's why that scene, so like for that Benson scene, I kind of took that with me. And a lot of times we would even hit play on music. So like we had a song we were boarding that to. Um, and I just thought it was cool to like, to take that kind of inspiration on it. Oh, yeah, and then it was so our, it, it was our music supervisor. Like a lot of the songs that we put in originally just as inspiration to get us there, we just couldn't get. Um, and yeah. we, you know, Keir Lehman, who is, uh, uh, such a genius with music, um, knows so much, uh, uh about, upcoming bands and also music that is obtainable, you know, t- you know, for a TV show that uh, sometimes was absolutely the spirit of our original source or other times was completely different, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> brought it alive in a way that we hadn't expected. Um, so we had a springboard that was just our wish list. Um, and often t- most of the time that was I- impossible to get. And, yeah, cannot credit here and Daniel Rojas, our uh, composer. In you know, th- it's impossible to credit them enough uh, with uh, how they made that a reality and and evolved it in ways that was even better than what we had hoped for. Yeah, the 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 songs that James and Kier and even Daniel made were just like, I mean, that was the most fun we had on the show. Like they would just send stuff, and it was like. How is this song not on the radio? This is amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. I'm, I'm still definitely still listening to the playlist that's on. Yeah, so good. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah. I guess getting into the the visuals a little bit. You you mentioned you guys mentioned you went to Korea and uh, it's like uh, Studio Mir animated uh, animated the show. What 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 was kind of the experience working with them? Yeah, uh, I mean, what the one nice thing is. Because we had a studio like Studio Mir that we knew could kill it with the animation, sometimes in 2D animation, you have to overwork your storyboards so that if the studio can handle it. And Mm. and sometimes that means if there's something you want to fix story-wise or you want to improve the storytelling, you just don't have time. Like, because you're spending all your time cleaning up boards. But because they were such a amazing talent we actually could send them boards that were very very simple and focused and reworked and and focus on the story which i i the, the show would not be what it is if we didn't have mir because of that they're just like incredible talent and, and credit should also go to them for um embracing rad's very unique angular uh, uh i would say almost punk rock uh drawing style <laughs> yeah um and it, which there isn't a show that you can point to that's exactly like that and they had to develop uh, a visual language uh to make it animatable um and most other studios would say well let's just you know make this a little more like this show over here because we know how to do this and and we could do that great um but this is new and, you know, we don't, you know, we, we couldn't do this for TV. Mir, when we first met with them, that was like the first thing they said to us was how excited they were to do Rad style. And um, that was, uh, uh, it, it took work to get there. It took a lot of uh, talking and, and sending uh, designs back and forth that would come from um, Ang- um, Angela Sung, our our uh, uh, art director, um, and but they, uh, um, that I think that work shows, and and it's part of why uh, you know the show, you know, uh, looks so. Uh, and I can say this because I didn't draw any of it. <laughs> um, looks so 
looks so amazing. Um, and you know, when I see it on the screen, I, I get excited every time because it's the show that's in that original web comic. Uh, we, we delivered that in an animated form, um, and credit to studio Mir and, um, uh, Angela Sung for, uh, being able to pull off that Herculean feat, uh, on a TV budget and TV schedule. Yeah, definitely, definitely looks so amazing. Um, you guys mentioned the visual style. Uh, I think I was struck we- reading the the co- the web comic how it was pretty. I think pretty similar to to the the show. Um, so like I, I guess like what inspired the style originally, and then how how was it like translating that uh, into into show form? Um, I mean, I'm a huge anime fan, so I'm I'm a huge fan of Tekken Concrete. I'm a huge fan of Fully Coolie. Um, but also like I mean, I grew up. I've been working at DreamWorks since 2006. So I'm surrounded by designers like Nico Marley, who designed um, Kung Fu Panda and How to Train Your Dragon. And, and those, that artwork's always been up on the wall around me. Like, I've always been looking at it. I've always been working on those movies. That That's like between looking at Nico's stuff and then my anime influences, I feel like the drawing style is just kind of halfway between those two things. Well, yeah, I mean, there's how about like color palettes? I feel like in there's there's one part of the the comic goes from like blue to purple um, tones. I feel like a lot of that maybe made it in the show. Yeah, um, I mean, a lot of that is I, I'm also just really into streetwear, fashion, sneaker culture. Uh, a, a lot of that is just influenced by those types of pops of color. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, that is cool. I, I guess related to to purple, um, Kipo ends up being <laughs> Kipo ends up being purple, and he's purple. And, and like like clear, it seems like by the end of the season, there's a plot reason that Kipo is is purple. But like, was um, how how did that come about? Uh, it was that like a style decision, and then and then there's plot later. It was that like a plot decision, and then how did that kind of in, factor into the whole? Style in the comic, the in the comic, they were just humans surviving. There was no like element. Um, I guess we're doing spoilers, right? People have already yeah, so seen Oh, yeah, spoilers yes. for, for the whole season. <laughs> spoilers. Uh, <laughs> there was no, like, half-mutant type concept. And, and DreamWorks was kind of like, you know, an Avatar Airbender, Aang's, like, pretty special. Like, is there something, like, or a lot of these shows, there's, there's basically they're like, for the comics, it's okay to be pretty simple, but we need something bigger. Like, we need something. Mm. And so okay. I don't build was when had I already come up with the Jaguar thing or did we come up with that together? I can't remember. That was, you, you had already talked about that with DreamWorks uh, before I came in. And my initial thought was, uh, I was, I don't know if I can swear on this podcast. I was about to, uh, <laughs> F, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and because it was such a great, it, it felt natural to the world and, it also felt like a uh, this wonderful wish fulfillment thing, and uh, stylistically, I thought, "Oh, that's kind of brilliant!" Like it explains your skin color, um, yeah. and uh, it it just fits in. It was just one of those ideas that, like, however it came about, like once you and I were moving forward with the show as a series, it just it was that thing that you could just point to and you know that that's right. Um, and um, then because you know, Wolf looks her, you know, she has a normal human skin tone. So does, so does Benson. And so do all of the, the humans in our, our show, except for Kipo. And that, you know, that, uh, um, it, you know, that synergy worked very well. <laughs> um, you, you know, it's interesting. I was so used to seeing her that color. <laughs> I, I notice a lot of people online are like, wouldn't other people notice she's purple? No, she just and looks it, pretty. She just looks and really it, pretty. And it wasn't until after I started seeing those comments, I'm like, oh yeah, she's purple. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, that was my same reaction though. I was like, ah, she just she just has a nice color vibe going on. It's normal. And then when the arm happened, I was like, oh, it's because of that. It's because she's half mute. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you think you, it plays like you just think assume it's a style thing, and then it's I think yeah. it's really, really satisfying when there's also a, a plot reason that, that comes into play. <laughs> Occasionally, I'll see somebody online get who's seen one or two episodes get angry that there's inconsistency to the skin colors, and I I have to fight myself to 
to you know tweet back weight, but uh, I, I have <laughs> <laughs> I have resisted that temptation. <laughs> That's cool. Um, how about the the post apocalyptic setting and like all the all the different types of mutes that that we see? Like, uh, what, what, what's some of the inspiration behind those? And then how how would uh, how do you guys go about flushing all the all the setting out in the show? So it's interesting. Like when I was originally doing it, I was just really inspired by what was going on in TV. Like there was Walking Dead, there was Game of Thrones, and I I, I had been working in feature. I was like, dang, like the cool stuff's happening in television. And so I was like, I just want to do something cool like that. So I was definitely like, all right, I'm inspired by Walking Dead. Let's do a post-apocalypse thing. I was also working on How to Train Your Dragon too, and I was drawing giant dragons. So I kind of was doing these compositions already with giant creatures. And and the first thing I drew was the Mega Bunny with all the... um, row of of bunny ears and i think that was just an inspiration of wanting to do walking dead but also already doing large creatures yeah um and then initially i started with um the gangs were human they were still themed and and the first gang i did was again they were cannibals which we didn't end up doing (laughs) (laughs) but they were that baroque kind of uh louis the 14th style and, oh, yeah. and they lived in trailer parks for some reason, but they still dress like that. Um, and then I started drawing um, more mutant animals and I was like, oh, this is way cooler. Because, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, everything's muted, mutated out of control anyway, so why not? By the, by the time all the, the, the comic came my way and, and I, I saw it, uh, I, I was really excited because it was an opportunity to tell a show about the end of the world in this absurd and whimsical way, but keep the stakes of it real. Um, and for me, uh, the power of telling a story about the end of the world is uh, important to pass on to kids. So you're not sugarcoating what's happening around the, in the world around them. And, I think we can all relate to feeling like this world is really ending. Um, And when you're really young, that could be really scary. Uh, Mm -hmm. And this was an opportunity to not diminish that, say, yes, this is real. This is very real. Um, But there is also this wonder in it. um, And uh, there's also an element of being able to uh, survive in that um, because of uh, the the found family um, and, uh, and overcome. Um, And it's uh, thematically, I thought it was a chance to talk about moving forward uh, and, and, and uh, embracing a world that does not recognize the the world that we know. Um, And uh, there was a real power in that to me. Um, So from an emotional standpoint, I thought, Oh, what a great story to be able to, to share with kids. I, I wished I had a, a show like that. Um, and then you also get to embrace the whimsical playful element of it. Um, because we got to spend hours and hours and hours. And first it was just rad and me. And then we had this amazing, amazing, and I cannot say amazing enough writing team, um, who I hope to do every show I ever do with, um, <laughs> uh, um, come in and we would, uh, build out these uh, the, these many fantastic lands that Kipo and the family of our show discover. Um, and sometimes that would come from, from uh, a drawing that Rad would do, and he would just draw something that, like, just occurred to him that was funny. Like, I think that's how the Newton wolves came up. Like, the, uh, Rad just drew these uh, the wolves that loved astronomy, and then we said, oh, well, they discovered, you know, a picture of Carl Sagan and the rubble of humanity uh, in what was, you know, in this old observatory uh, and based their whole society out of that. Um, and, you know, or, uh, you know, sometimes we would just uh, get to tap into the playful side of our brains to see what we could come up with in, 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 in this world. And, and it was the most fun sandbox to play in. Um, but no matter what we came up with, uh, our mandate was always to, to keep the, the the stakes of the world real. So 
it, it didn't come across as glib and, and distancing that this was an experience that we had to survive with our heroes. I think um, that's really lovely. And I was just going to ask, because one of my initial questions was going to be, what do each of you consider to be the most important thing you were trying to express with the show? And that could be, you know, anything from themes to setting to art style. But like what if you if you think you could surmise like that one thing that's most important to you in terms of expressing, what would it be for each of you? My my totally honest answer is. I, uh, first and foremost, I was trying to make a show people would enjoy watching. So, yeah. um, <laughs> like an entertainment value. And and, and I, I come from a storyboarding background. So, like, you know, a lot of times we're writing scenes, we're writing a lot of comedy. And it's almost like doing a stand-up set where you go up and you pitch it to a room and you're trying to make people laugh. And mm-hmm. I just, after doing that for years, it's like where my brain is at. Um I wasn't consciously like, like I wasn't consciously like, Oh, we're going to, you know, change the world or anything (laughs) like that. Um, but at the same point you do want to, it's hard to be motivated on things unless you, you, you feel like you're contributing to the world, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, that, that is, uh, a very important point (laughs) to get across like that. Yes. We, you know, at the end of the day, we are, we are writing to connect to an audience and, and make an audience laugh and use the power of animation. Um, and, uh, I mean, I think it's, it's also, it is an opportunity to tell stories that are, uh, I mean, I, I believe in, you know, I don't know if it changes the world, but I do believe in a power to stories to, um, uh, help us process the you know things in our own own lives um and i mean for me kipo is is about uh embrace it, uh, not being afraid of a of a, a new and unrecognizable world um and finding wonder uh in what might seem like the end of the world that we as we know it um and and also to do weird make people laugh <laughs> <laughs> well said uh yeah i mean in in turn uh, related to like the the power of the show i think something a lot of people are talking about something that really struck us is the the diver- diversity of the show and uh, some questions about that um definitely starting with how uh we're talking on the podcast this might be we think it might be the first time in like kids animation a uh, main characters just said like i'm gay uh with yeah. benson in episode six um really curious about like what went into uh, the decision of having Benson say it so explicitly, like how, how much pushback you guys got um, and just in general, your approach to to telling that story with Benson. I mean, when I did the comic, the, the character of Benson, I, I wanted to make a character that was like Superman, like a hero type. And then you find out he's gay because I, I felt like there just weren't a lot of characters like that portrayed in media. Um, yeah. And I, I just thought like, you know, if someone's seeing someone that's their hero, and then you're like, oh, and he's gay. It, it, it puts you mentally in kind of a different place. Um, so when we pitch a show, I was like, I, I want this character to be gay. And Peter Gal just said, that's great, but he has to say the words, mm-hmm. I'm gay. Oh, interesting. <laughs> and I didn't know that was important. Peter is gay. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> and uh and and I was like, that's great. Yeah, let's. And then me and uh, I, and Bill wrote the episode and, and did a great job of um, you know executing that. And we we wanted that moment to come out in a very in a way that was organic to the show. Um, mm-hmm. And it was like for me, this what was uh, great about uh, working with Rad and and uh, getting to tell the story. Uh, it was clear from the beginning that our priority was to, to use as a springboard the world that we know today um, and uh, make that very real. Um, so our world in Los Angeles is very diverse um, and uh, inclusive. Um, and we wanted that to be reflected in all of the human characters. Um, and so for, for, the, for that story for Benson, 
we we knew that he was okay. That was just a part of who he was, but it's not what defined him. And it was just right. finding the right way for it to come out. And this is a world where there's not a lot of humans on the surface, but they're kids coming of age. So when they're with each other, feelings are going to come out. And in that episode, um, w- uh, we realized, oh, this is, uh, uh, and this also is the result of our great writers' room. Um, uh, and many other voices on the show weighing in too, uh, as, as we figured out the story before, uh, um, before I, I happened to write that episode. Um, that's how it works. Like everybody comes up on our show, came up with the stories and then one writer would go off and write that episode. Um, and that instance, it was a story about, um, keep, really people coming of age. She's turning 13. Uh, and suddenly this, this boy is paying a lot of attention to her. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. and he's doing it for the, for the, the, the most genuine of reasons. He wants to, uh, do something special for her birthday, but she's a little bit younger. She's 13, he's 16. And she, you know, misreads his, you know, his, uh, um, gestures and he's a little bit older and doesn't realize, oh yeah, maybe what I'm doing is like uh, sending signals that I didn't intend it to because she might read into things more than because she's not, you know, quite where I am, but this is just who I am. So um, that, it w- it, that felt like the most natural way for it, for, for that, that to come out. Um, and we wanted to deal with it, but the show wasn't, you know, he, he, it's not about um, uh, him being gay. It's just a part of who he is. And, um, and we were able to, uh, uh, tell that story through, you know, through her, uh, um, that coming of age moment. Um, and I was, I'm so delighted and proud that that has meant something. I, 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 you know, I, I, we both felt very supported by the studio to get to tell this story. And Peter Dow was super supportive we did have to, that episode, we had to like float it up the flagpole all the way to the president of DreamWorks just because mm. yeah. it hadn't, you know, like that kind of story hadn't really been done, but I did not expect it to strike a chord and there to have been articles written about it. That was not why we did that story where, I mean, we're glad that it, it means something to people and it's, it's the kind of stories that we, you know, want to be out there that are reflective of the world that, 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 that we know. Um, but it wasn't, what's the word I'm searching for? Um, it, it, we I'm doing sorry. It for like a pat on the back or anything. <laughs> yes. It came exactly. from a genuine place. Yeah. Thanks. And I'll just say that's something well, that I think <laughs> sometimes I lose track of that just because like part of what we do, our job as a podcast is to watch all this media and consume it and, and compare things just across the board to see like who's interested in making what kind of content, how are people having impressions about that? Um, but the more we talk to people in the industry, the more it seems like when things like this happen, it really does tend to come from a very genuine personal place and not just a, like, we want to make a big statement about this because we can. Um, and I think those always tend to be the most successful cases because you fall in love with the characters because they feel real and they have a lot going on and you identify with them for a lot of reasons but also <laughs> even though Benson is great regardless and it's very true like you're saying that it, it isn't his whole character the fact that he says it is something that is so wonderfully undeniable and I think that's something that a lot of shows do I don't I won't want to use the word struggle because maybe they have very you know specific reasons for not being explicit but it is kind of a nice surprise and i mean maybe one day we'll get to a place where it doesn't have to be a surprise but for now it's just that alone is is something really nice to hold on to i think especially so i'm not at all surprised that a lot of people have been writing about it because it is just a nice a nice genuine moment and kipo just embraces him immediately and it's not a big deal and then they just you know go on with the rest of their adventure but yeah, it's just it's truly lovely. I'm <laughs> I'm glad it happened. You yeah, know, yay, it was really really meaningful to a lot of us for sure. Um, cool. Yeah, it's it, and other 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 aspects of diversity. I mean, we, uh, I think it's really striking that um, a lot of the the main cast of characters are are black, and in general, yeah. the show is really diverse. Like, how how do you guys kind of end up there with such a diverse slate of characters when a lot of other shows kind of don't get there? When when I was doing the. So when I did the comic, I had started a 
like a skateboard company. And I was sponsor. I was making decks and hats and clothing. And I, I was sponsoring a couple kids that I met at the skate park. And it, it turned out they happened. One was in the, the Watts housing projects and another lives in Inglewood. And I was going out there skating a lot. Um, and it was just interesting because like they would say things to me, like I'd be the only white kid at the skate park. And he was <laughs> Isaiah, my buddy, who I was sponsoring at the time, just looked at me one day. He's like, you know, these kids don't know white people. <laughs> it's like, what are you talking about? He's like, we grow up like our whole life. We're just only no black people. And I, I just thought that was an interesting thing he wanted to tell me. And <laughs> uh, I was casting and I was like. I was skating at that skate park when he said that to me. I was like, that's got to be weird when they watch TV that it doesn't reflect what they see every day. Mm, yeah. Um, and it kind of, I was like, well, why not <laughs> change up our casting a little bit from what I did in the comic? So they wanted us to make Benson younger. Um, and I just made him look like my buddy Isaiah. I Isaiah wanted me to let people know he is not gay. <laughs> <laughs> um but uh, it, he acts like Isaiah. He dresses like Isaiah. Um, so, like, a lot of that was just my environment where I was around, you know. But, yeah, that, that's awesome. Um, the Yeah, and, and, and in the in the webcomic, I know a lot of people noticed uh, ben, Benson's, like, a, a big buff dude. Uh, white oh, dude. is yeah. he really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's funny. I also, like, like, Isaiah was super cool. He's like a, the coolest dude. Like he's always dressed super cool. And in my mind, again, my main purpose was like, I just want the coolest dude. I want people to be watching this. Be like that dude is so cool. Yeah. And then you're like, and he's gay, <laughs> you know? Um, I just wanted to kind of change the way people think about that. Yeah. Cause I've seen it. I, very hip. You know, I've seen people say things and, and act a certain way. And I'm like, it's just because you don't know any gay people, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I think I, I would go, go. I would go back back to like what I was saying that it, it is reflective of the the world that we live in today. Uh, like, uh, so we wanted the people that populated to look like the the, pe the people you know the, of Los Angeles today, since we're um, you know humanity is basically frozen where it was, you know, stuck in these underground cities two hundred years later. Um, and that way, Kipo herself is is like a proxy for us because uh she's never seen yeah. the surface before so it's like us experiencing the surface for the first time but uh that that you know we kind of infused that into you know when i came in um it was an exciting opportunity to get to to uh um tell stories that you haven't seen before uh, uh because there aren't a lot of stories with a fully diverse cast and it opens up more avenues and and there aren't a lot of animated shows with two uh, young girls uh, yeah. anchoring the, the 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 world, and that was extremely exciting uh, for for me that, to get to. That definitely came from um, Gina Davis came to campus one day, and she was like, she was just talking about, you know, the world is half female, but then she's just <laughs> pulling up, she's just pulling up clips like, why why isn't why is the media not half female? Like why? And then she was like, how many of you animators were like drawing today and did a background and, and go back to your desk and look, I bet you made them all men, you know, that kind of thing where you subconsciously don't, if you're not aware of it, you'll make it 90% male. Like, unless someone says to you, are you paying attention? Like, which Gina, when she came to the campus, she's like, I want you guys to pay attention. When you're creating it, like the world is 50% female. Are you actually tracking it? Um, so I always tried to keep that in mind when I was doing designs. We, we, we carried that through, you know, even to the, the um, smaller characters and the yeah. supporting characters. Oh, I noticed uh, that. Yes, yeah, it's lovely. Just so many female characters. And without eyelashes and lips, it, it's just... <laughs> Uh, how far we've come in, you know, 20 plus years where you don't have to make something very specifically feminine for it to read as female. That, that feels like an accomplishment somehow. But it's, it's, it's definitely if, if Gina Davis hadn't come to the lect 
like come to campus and given us that lecture, I don't know that it would have been on my radar or it's something I even noticed. Interesting. Mm. Yeah, that's that's really cool. Um, I, it's starting to wrap up. What's um we mentioned a lot. I think you guys have mentioned a lot of them already. But what what's some of your favorite scenes uh, from from the first season that kind of stand out to you looking back? Whoa! <laughs> I love that. I mean, I love that Benson intro. Yeah. Oh, love that so too. <laughs> so good. Uh, I love all of episode nine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what about you, Bill? I, I uh, I'm trying to, I'm thinking of all of our children, Rad, <laughs> the whole thing, um, and trying to pick, um, I, I'll pick two, I'll choose two moments. Um, I, I really love in episode uh, two, uh, the, um, the uh, skyscraper, the whole skyscraper ridge sequence going mm. from, escaping from the uh um the mod frogs uh bridge to going through skyscraper bridge because it's the first time we get to meet uh, the family uh, see the family of our show functioning as a family and uh it's ex- like looking back and i'm like oh i'm so excited like, i love looking at that seeing where they start um and how they're starting to function with each other and you know knowing where they, where we took them over the season um it's uh, uh, I'm proud of, uh, uh, that we, uh, uh, pulled off a dynamic, uh, among them, um, and, and we're able to carry it through. And I think my other favorite scene is, is in episode seven, um, when, uh, um, uh, which was the Mulholland episode, um, when, uh, Kipo gets this wish fulfillment of getting to have her mom for a day and then, has to say goodbye to her. And, and, uh, um, it's, it was this, uh, we got to have great comedy from our amazing actors, uh, especially Sterling K Brown, who was pulled off the, the dad having that uncomfortable talk with his daughter about <laughs> changes and like not knowing how to handle that. And then she get mom comes in. Um, and, uh, we had G come in, uh, she, so great as song, uh, the dream song in that episode. Um, and Kipo gets her mom for a day and then has to say, it makes that choice to say goodbye to her at the end. Um, it's, it's both touching and funny and heartbreaking at the same time. So I'm, 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 I'm proud of how, how we, we pulled that off. Pardon me for patting my, our, ourselves in the back. <laughs> that one. You deserve it. Very deserved. Yeah. Kind uh, of good. jumping off of rat um, talking about how much he loved episode nine. I just want to ask about, you know, where did Wolf come from? Her personality is very striking. She's such a good foil to Kipo. And just in some ways, it seems like her character arc has some of the most weight of any of the main cast in the first season. Yeah. And I just, I want to know more about her. Just tell me all the things. I, so I, the the initial inspiration is anytime I sit down to to board a scene, I always have to pick either an actor or a friend so I know how they're going to act. So like I'll I'll just give you an example like like in my mind, Kipo was just Jess from New Girl, and Wolf was Mad Max. Oh <laughs> and then, wow! Like Benson acts like my friend Isaiah. Um, so I, I I don't ever board without having a person in mind. Mm-hmm. So that was kind of, and I, and I like to think of pairings that go well together. So I loved that odd couple pairing. I was like, that'll work. <laughs> that'll be easy to board. That'll be easy to write. If we have this kind of odd couple, like the one person super high, the other, and that was kind of the starting point of the personalities. And then I, I hadn't thought a lot about backstory. So Bill came in and came up with all that backstory. And I was like, Oh yeah, I didn't think about the fact that Wolf probably used to talk. Oh, <laughs> She's <yeah>. wary. <laughs> and then when he told me like the ideas for that backstory, I was like, "Wow, that's amazing." <laughs> that was. I think that's a, that's an example of the happy synergy between having collab. You know, having a successful collaboration. Uh, I mean, I, I Rad is it has these uncanny instincts and and created this amazing character on on and actually in, in uh, i believe wolf in the comic was was, was designed as mexican-american but then we had sydney michaela come in and and uh she gave us such a uh a great 
performance, I, I believe that she had been living on her own uh, <laughs> since she was five <laughs> years old. Uh, and uh, we then Rad, uh, like we Rad, uh, redesigned the look of Wolf and made her African American. Um, and um, uh, then you know, but we, we we had been talking about that backstory for Wolf like since I I was brought on the project. I thought, oh, that's just a great opportunity to have uh, a very. That's an example of not being afraid of sadness within a comedy. I think it. That, you know, it's finding that right balance of the two. Um, uh, because I would say Kipo is an adventure comedy first and foremost, more than anything, but I believe adventure comedies absolutely can, can grapple with sadness. Um, and to have somebody that's been surviving on the surface for that long, uh, they probably had something tough to go on when they were, mm -hmm. when they were, when they were very young. Um, and, uh, you know, as episode nine evolved, we, we, I, I'll, I'll say this, Brad and I are two uh, uh, white dudes, uh, and uh, we have a, a fully diverse cast with um, two young girls as the leads. Um, one is black. Uh, so that's very far from our own life experience. And we, uh, it was the studio supported us in this. It was very important for us to put uh, as many women and people of color in pos creative positions of power in our show. We had two two black directors, uh, a woman director, uh, uh, our two head writers, Joanna Lewis and Christine Sanko are women. Um, and that helped us round out these stories in ways that are beyond our life experience and bring an authenticity to it. Um, and I think that really shows uh, most in episode nine uh, um, with Wolf's backstory. Um, like I came up with the backstory, but then when you, in terms of the details of it, like how she looks, uh, um, like what it's like to be in that, you know, family that, that, that discovered her and raised, is raising her, but ultimately betrays her. Um, a lot of that came from our conversations with our, uh, our great, uh, staff, um, that helped us, uh, uh, mold those stories. Um, and yeah, like uh, Chase, Chase was like, oh no, this is how like someone I know growing up, this, their hair would fall out this way. That's like a thing like when her hair gets disheveled or Chris, our other director at the, like we had cast um, Kipo as Korean and it, we were planning on, on making a Korean dad. And he just was like, you're making the dad black. <laughs> so I was like, <laughs> okay. I mean, isn't that a little weird that she's Korean? He's like, I don't care. We're making him black and I want to see a black dad on screen. So like, it was cool to have people that influenced the show in that way. Yeah, Absolutely. I mean, it's really cool. Will like totally answered one of my follow-up questions. I was just going to ask you straight up, like how diverse is your creative team? Can they speak to some of these characters <laughs> experiences? But clearly, <laughs> yes. And clearly they did. I feel yeah, like, yeah, that, that that's a huge part of making it feel like it can resonate with other people who share that experience. Even if you personally don't. Yeah, it, it's interesting the way our directing and I just hired, I, I work in feature. So I just, I only knew a few people in TV. I just hired the people I knew, which happened to be Chris, Chase, Stan, <laughs> um, which happened to be diverse people. Yeah, that's and, that's and I, I, You know, I think it's a thing because whenever I go to Comic-Con and I hang out, I'm into a certain art style. So I'm into yeah. anime. I'm into, so I'm friends with, I don't know if you guys know LaShawn Thomas, who does a lot of anime with Netflix. Yes, LaShawn's uh, amazing. Is he I still in Korea right now? I know he was a, for a he's while. He's in Japan. Oh, he's in Japan. Yeah, awesome. and he's, I don't know if I'm supposed to say what he's doing. He's doing a ton of really cool stuff. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Can we like that? I did LaShawn and Chase and, and Chris, and they're all just, we're all into anime for whatever reason, you know? Um, we all kind of gravitated towards each other. So when I was like, the Chris and Chase were the first people I hit up. I'm like, dude, I'm doing a show. <laughs> but then it just turned out to be nice because, like, I'm like, hey, does this hair look okay? Right. <laughs> you know, um, you have people to bounce off, or 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 Chris being like, no, nah, we got to do this. You know, I'm like, okay. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, that, that's really good stuff. I, la, la, uh, I think we have to wrap up. Last thing, any, anything you guys can say on more Kipo? No? So don't just say uh, no. Give him a chance. <laughs> I assume it's no. No. Okay. 
Okay, we'll, we'll be. We'll, there's, 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 there's a, a moon boy above us with a fishing pole to yank us up <laughs> in the air if we, if we say anything else. Okay, we'll be, we'll, we'll be waiting for any word. Very excited. Um, yeah, that, that was, that was great. Thank you guys so much, uh, Rat and Bill, for joining us. Yeah, cool. Thank you so much. This was a wonderful pleasure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, thanks, uh, guys. Uh, yeah, thanks for listening, guys. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Yeah.